Greetings everyone all over the globe. So good to have you with us. I'm really looking forward today because film noir is very close to me. It's one of the most realistic film genres because in one film you can have some humor, you can have real friends who are ready to give their life for you and you can have the others who pretend who sell you out everything this covers the whole thing you know and coming from world war ii where i witnessed that that's the story and i'll have a list of films and i'll mention some happenings before we start the program i would like to qualify my last week's program where i mentioned from my experience that there are only few jazz critics, only a few, that really know the music and unfortunately some of the big ones at times abuse their power and they know that with their pen they could help musicians or destroy them and I've seen that. Some of the good ones that I had experience with and I saw like for example in New York Gary Giddens who is an author he plays piano and he studied music thoroughly John S. Wilson can feel the music another one John Pareles and there have been few others who are very dedicated study the music and can feel it and right from the heart, not from an ego trip. Also, Leonard Feather, who played piano, has done some good things too. So, they are good critics, and maybe another time I'll give you an example of what some did, and you'll be amazed. Anyway, that's a story. So, the film genre or film noir, famous, famous films, out of the Past, Asphalt Jungle, Laura, Kiss of Death, Cry of the City, where the sidewalk ends, DOA, Dark Corner, Night Has a Thousand Eyes, Crime in the Streets, An Out of Your Murder, that's a newer one, Otto Preminger and Duke Ellington Orchestra played, Jimmy Stewart, also the later one too, or maybe around the same time, Odds Against Tomorrow, with uh, John Lewis doing the score, Henry Belafonte. So these films projected the life that was happening, people who were down and out, and who were trying to do a heist, which was against the law, but interesting things happened. And another film that I'm going to mention, House on Telegraph Hill, story about San Francisco. I'll tell you the story when that comes. So there are all kinds of themes, all kinds of themes. And one of the most famous is Laura, 1944. Great film by Otto Preminger, Gene Turney, Dana Andrews, Clifton Webb. It's about a beautiful lady that was kind of managed by a, what do you call, a snob who pretended he's Mr. Know-it-all, Clifton Webb. And check out the film, the music by David Raxon, and after I play the tune, I will tell you how he wrote it and how come he came about it. Very interesting. Laura. <laughs> Thank you. 
two exceptional recordings of this tune, Charlie Parker, Bird with Strings, and the beautiful oboe playing on Bird with Strings, some of you may not be familiar, it was Mitch Miller who was outstanding oboe player, and later you probably heard Mitch Miller singers, you know, he made a lot of money with not very complicated arrangements, simple, but that's what he did later. Birds with Strings. The other masterpiece, piano masterpiece, is by Errol Garner. And uh, something happened. I could not send my email on Friday because the company that I have all of a sudden said, you cannot promote music. Uh, what is this? Uh, what kind of a state are we living in? I thought, I told the guy, we're in the U.S., we are not in some totalitarian state. Anyway, in that email I sent these samples, but some of you didn't get it. Errol Garner, who could not read, played Laura with such sophisticated harmonies and piano touch, you could hear Rachmaninoff influence also, you can hear Debussy beautiful. So those two recordings. Now the story behind Laura. Otto Preminger engaged David Raxon to write the music. So he was working on a score and he went home for a break. At home he finds a note his wife wrote. I'm leaving you. He was totally depressed, devastated, went to the piano and wrote Laura from that experience. And called Johnny Mercer, he wrote the lyrics. Now this story was told to me by a wonderful vocalist, Steve Siddham, who recorded an album, we did an album at the Plush Room. And his son, Stephen, was studying at the UC Southern USC, Southern California program, and his composition teacher said, David Raxon is here, let me introduce you. So Stephen asked him, how did you come to write that song? And what I just told you, he told him that story. Oh boy, interesting, interesting stuff. Now, film noirs use a lot of terms that I told some friends they never heard. What is it? He took a powder. Well, let's say somebody owes you money and they split. They took a powder. And when somebody talks to the police and gives away some other people if they were involved in a scam or a project, He's called a canary. He sang like a canary. And my friend didn't know a criminal who goes to electric execution. They didn't know he got the chair. And when somebody squeals on you, like in case World War II, my father worked for the underground he hid an uh, American flyer in the attic. Nazi officers slept downstairs. They didn't find anything out, and luckily we got him to safety. After that, somebody wanted to get some brownie points from the Germans. Also, he didn't like us, so he ratted on us. Luckily, we were okay. Okay, here we go about the first film that I saw called Kiss of Death. Richard Widmark, I believe he, he was either nominated, I didn't check, or won the Academy Award for supporting role. He played a psychopath hitman. Victor Mature was there, Colleen Gray. And on Market Street, you had main theaters like the Paramount or Orpheum, MGM, Warfield, St. Francis, but you had small theaters. Strand Theater showed a lot of film noirs. When I saw this film, I saw people 
helping each other, other ratting, and it, it reminded me of uh, the real life during World War II. Street Scene is a title of my film noir album with Akira Tana and Larry Grenadier. The music of Street Scene was used in many 20th Century Fox films, opening and ending. And uh, I'll play it for you and I'll tell you with some of the films. Kiss of Death, the film, which opens with this theme and ends it, was directed by Henry Hathaway and Victor Mature, as I said, Richard Widmark, Serbian actor Carl Malden played one of the police lieutenant and Brian Dunleavy was the DA and Victor Mature who was in prison for this heist. heist. He didn't want to 
reveal his people. But when he found out what they did to his wife and they are not friends, then he decided to talk. This way he could see his children and stuff because those guys were totally ruthless and hardcore criminals. In the film, famous scene, Richard Widmark throws the old lady, the actress Mildred Dunnock, in a wheelchair down the stairs. So that's, that's what it's about. The other films where the composer is Alfred Newman, he conducted 20th Century Fox Orchestra. Go, if you can find How to Marry a Millionaire, it has nothing to do with film noir, but in front of the movie you see the complete 80-piece orchestra, beautiful version. In the other films you can see, hear this theme, Dark Corner, where the sidewalk ends, Cry of the City. That's a street scene. And next we go to Dark Corner film, starring early days, 46, Lucille Ball, very attractive in the early days, very feminine before she became a comic character. The actor was Mark Stevens, and the other actor, Clifton Webb, who owned the art gallery, another kind of a high up, uh, in the end, tr proves to be a criminal, snobbish guy, and in, in the movie film, Laura, the only thing that I can say, the film was good, but the casting was unrealistic. Clifton Webb and beautiful Jean Turney, it's hard to see a romantic connection there, but otherwise it's a good film. So Dark Corner, like other films, use jazz. In the Dark Corner, the wonderful blues and standard pianist Eddie Haywood who also wrote Canadian Sunset, played the blues while Lucy and Mark Stevens were dancing. <laughs> of course Eddie Haywood had horns he had bass and drums but it was about that tempo nice groove and they're dancing go and watch Dark Corner it's available on YouTube like Mark Stevens the movie started talking at least in Burlingame and uh, his partner who was a 
kind of womanizer but very not trustworthy character sold him out and Mark Stevens served time so he went to New York he became a private eye and the other guy was there trying to do him in again well there were some good people that helped you gotta see that movie and directed also by Henry Hathaway who did Kiss of Death next we go to high wall theme and I just happened to see the movie and I'm listening to the theme opening written by Bronislav Kaper oh, I, I never heard this before I recorded it on my high wall album and I'm the only guy it looks like who recorded this rare gem theme from high wall watching film wars for a long time and gathered some good information at the same time I'd like to pay a tribute and thank a good friend Arthur Arthur Tashiro who has worked on films and he's really an expert on film noir he knows most of the films who is in a cast director production and uh, we shared uh, some film noir terms we mentioned he reminded me of a fall guy somebody who takes the rap like in a Maltese Falcon Humphrey Bogart in the end of the movie when the police were investigating I think who took the Falcon or something the subject well we need to have a fall guy and Sidney Greenstreet had an assistant Elisha Cook who always kind of played the loser. So Humphrey, I think, said, oh, 
will make Wilmer the fall guy. So Arthur mentioned another thing. He took the rap. Somebody who unfortunately got blamed and he was sent to prison, you know. So many interesting terms also, you probably heard the term framed, when they framed somebody who didn't do anything. Anyway, Dark Corner, wonderful film. And High Wall, Robert Taylor played a World War II pilot who had an accident and lost his memory in part. When he comes home, his wife, he finds out, is having an affair with the actor in the film, Herbert Marshall. And he's so angry that he grabs her by the throat, but he doesn't complete it. The other guy does. So he's sent to a mental institution behind walls, high wall, and the doctor, Audrey Totter, is trying to help him get cleared. A very interesting film. Next, we go to another different theme film, The Night Has Thousand Eyes, directed by John Farrell, Mia Farrell's father. And it's about, the, okay, I'll tell you about the composer. It's about a nightclub entertaining kind of theatrical psychic Edward G. Robinson, who with his assistants have signals, they talk to a person and they figure out something about her. But what happens during a performance? All of a sudden, the real power comes to him. He says, lady, you better go home. Your house is on fire and somebody else's family member was sick. Then after that experience with his power, he starts seeing some real heavy things and it makes his life very difficult. Now here is the theme. The Victor Young wrote a film score but the theme Night Has Thousand Eyes was not written by him, by somebody else. I'll tell you about it.
when I saw that Victor Young wrote a score, I assumed that he wrote a theme, but very hip doctor who plays piano, Harry Verby, no, he said, my friend Benjamin Wiseman, I think he said he played for his wedding, he wrote a song. Yeah, it's true, Benjamin Wiseman wrote Night Has a Thousand Eyes, a great recording by John Coltrane and uh, McCoy Tyner. So next we move to a wonderful film, House on Telegraph Hill, directed by Richard Wise, one of the great Hollywood directors. He did classic science fiction, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Also later, Sound of Music. Richard Wise worked with Orson Welles on the famous film, Citizen Kane, very seasoned director. House on Telegraph Hill was on Telegraph Hill in San Francisco and has an interesting story. So before I tell you the story in the film, what happened, Richard Miami, who passed away was one of the creative Napa Valley presenters. He was working in Madavi Winery. He helped us with the Napa Valley Festival presenting music, and he was presenting film noirs at the Copia. He may be reopening again in Napa. So he said, I would like you to write a piece. I'm gonna show House on Telegraph Hill. So I wrote a piece view from Telegraph Hill. It's on my CD high wall and I'll tell you a little more about it after I play. And I wrote it in the style of 50s bebop ballads with those kind of harmonies and melodies. <laughs> Thank you. 
this CD, High Wall, had two great rhythm sections, one with Eddie Marshall and Larry Grenadier. That was the trio I had in the early 80s before Larry moved to New York, Eddie Marshall, great drummer. The other rhythm section, Paul Keller from Detroit and Chucky McPherson, Charles's son, two swinging East Coast cats. And on this album, we have two live tracks from Pete Douglas's Bach Dancing Dynamite, two really high energy tracks with the live audience. And the CD was co-produced by a very hip lady, Judy Kopanik, who has a master degrees maybe in a couple areas. One of them, she is a top librarian, worked at the San Francisco main library. She could find anything and she loves music. She presented concerts and Judy co-produced the album. So the title View from Telegraph Hill has a subtitle, Judy's Theme. Another person who liked my tune, recorded it and made a video is Black Olive Jazz Lady Kay Kostopoulos and her videographer, very professional guy. Why don't you go on Google and put, I think, I'm not sure of the exact title, maybe view from Telegraph Hill, Kay Kostopoulos, Black, Black Olive Jazz, taking you through Telegraph Hill, Bay Area, really very, very, very pretty stuff. So that's a little story on that. And one of the really well-known films is of, uh, what do you call, film noir genre, it's Detour. And the director is Edgar Almer, who did films in very short time. This one grabs you, and it's an unfortunate story of a pianist who played classical and jazz from New York, and his lady friend who wanted to go to Hollywood and maybe try their luck, so she left early to go and look for some gigs while he was hitchhiking his way and ran into all kinds of problems that can happen in film noir, a lot of bad luck. The theme that these two played is I Can't Believe You're In Love With Me by Jimmy McHugh.
this was around 1946, perhaps around 53, eight years later or so, a movie comes out, The Kane Mutiny, story by novelist Herman Wook. Uh, interesting story about a mutiny on a ship. It's not based on a real event, but wonderful story. Humphrey Bogart played the captain. And what happens? I can't believe you're in love with me was in a film. So it becomes popularized in the 50s. And great saxophonist Brew Moore, Lester Young disciple, recorded a tune. And at the beginning of the film, the actress May Wynn, who played the nightclub singer, she was in love with the young Navy ensign Robert Francis. She sings it in a nightclub, but it's in a slower version. The voice behind her was the Les Brown vocalist, wonderful singer, Joanne Greer. Go on YouTube, put Kane Mutiny, I can't believe you're in love with me, and listen to the beautiful voice. And May Wynn did a wonderful job lip syncing. So that's the story. I'm not sure if I forgot something on that. Oh, yeah. The detour film, the actor was Tom Neal, and the femme fatale was Anne Savage. Oh, terrible things happened anyway. But uh can't believe you're in love with me. It was in a film. Next we go to Body and Soul, film about boxing, but also about gangsters. Robert Rosen was the director. I think he might have been one of the blacklisted ones. And the song by Johnny Green, it was written in the early 30s, and he was the music director for MGM. Um, John Garfield was the prize fighter. Lily Palmer, his partner, his lady friend, and a beautiful tune, all classic, Body and Soul.
Some uh, recordings you need to hear. Benny Goodman recorded this with Teddy Wilson, Gene Krupa, trio version. And Teddy Wilson, one of the earliest to use a light touch on the piano and swing also hard, but beautiful lyrical melodies. And... Um, I can't help her, but one time I played at Pearls, Kim Nally owned Pearls, I played with Jeff Chambers and Omar Clay. During the break there is a downstairs at Downbeat magazine and uh, there was a blindfold test with the Heat Brothers and they were listening to a record I won't name, a modern trumpet player played many notes avant-garde. And they said, hey, this guy sounds like a mosquito. <laughs> then, body and soul came. Ah, this is music. The music, melodic stuff. The other thing about this tune, one of the classic recordings, of course, the famous one after Benny Goodman was Coleman Hawkins, the Hawk, in 39. He was in Europe for five years, comes back, records body and soul, does not play the melody, plays around the melody, but you can hear it, but everything it does, he improvises a famous solo, Coleman Hawkins, the later version, another classic. When Clifford Brown died, Max Roach replaced him with Kenny Dorham, unsung hero, great trumpet player. And Sonny, Rima Sonny Rollins remained in the band. Richie Powell, pianist, role was taken by great pianist from Philadelphia, Ray Bryant. He had a beautiful touch and great blues. The version by Max Roach, Max Roach plus four, body and soul, you have to listen to it. Sonny had a beautiful ballad sound in those days, low and medium and high, beautiful tone. And Kenny Dorham played a great solo. Anyway, that's body and soul. Next, we go to Asphalt Jungle, a classic heist film about some guys who were down and out and Sam Jaffe played a mastermind German guy who always could figure where was a good place to hit. This was a big jewelry store in Midwest. They figured a plan and something went haywire, but you had Sterling Hayden part of in the film and you had the MGM actor, actor Louis Calhern, a lawyer who lived in high style. He had a mistress, Marilyn Monroe. He had several places. He was running out of money, so he was desperate. So he joined in the heist. And in this film, there weren't particular movie themes, but to show you that all those films use jazz in the end of the film, you had a bebop jukebox dance and Sam Jaffe, the old man, had one flaw. He had a weakness for young girls, young women. So when he saw this lady jitterbugging, that hung him up. That was what happened. Police got in there. He could have left earlier. But they played bebop.
I believe that Andrew uh, Previn wrote, who was a jazz pianist, uh, he wrote some music for the film, but he might have been the one that orchestrated a real typical bebop line. And um, to show you what happened, they got to Jules, so Sam Jaffe, who, who spoke with a German accent, did a great role. He had all the jewels sewn in his overcoat, and they, his cab driver was taking him to Cleveland, where he was going to fly out to Mexico, but they stopped in, and he got hung up watching this young lady, and the cab driver said, we better go. Too late. The police came there. And his downfall was the weakness for young women. Now, one of the greatest heists in history in Argentina was at a bank, $20 million in jewels. And the people, the masterminds, had a phenomenal plan. They destroyed the alarm system. They got away. Later, they were sent to jail, but the money was never found figured out who was paid off. What happened, they didn't just rob this bank for greed. The 1% of rich people had their money there in Argentina and they were controlling the money, destroying the economy, raising the inflation. So these people wanted to be kind of like Robin Hood. They, they wanted to get the money and make a point. What happened there? Another weakness. There's always some kind of flaw. The mastermind had a girlfriend on the side. The wife found out. She sang like a canary and they got all of them. <laughs> so it, there's always something, you know. Anyway, I think will conclude with a great, really good film from 1941, Blues in the Night. It's about a band traveling, a white band who loved African-American black music. And they heard the gospel, the blues, and the clarinet player in the film was Elia Kazan, who, and I'll tell you who played, Jack Carson played trumpet, and the pianist was played by actor Richard Worf, and I'll tell you later who the real musicians were. Jimmy Lunsford band was in the film. And what happened with this, Elia Kazan, wanted to do this in a play format, theatrical play, in New York. I think it would have been great. It had a story, but it had gangster too in it, and Femme Fatale, who was played by, let me think of her name, uh, she was Kim Novak's mother in Picnic. I'll, I'll think of her name. And Lloyd Nolan was jealous of her. I think he might have knocked her off. So the film did have a criminal element. You can call it film noir. But after Ilya Kazan, they didn't want to do the play. He sold the rights to Warner Brothers. And Blues in the Night, Harold Arlen, one of the great composers, he was the closest to the blues, one of them besides other composers like Gershwin. His father was a cantor, so he heard those blue notes from the east in the church. Also next door, John Hendricks told me, was the African-American Baptist Church where you hear the authentic stuff. So Harold Darlin had that feeling. And also he wrote sophisticated tunes like on this song, Blues in the Night, the bridge interlude was totally sophisticated, different than the blues form, but that was Harold Arlen. Thank mm -hmm. you.
The pianist who played behind the scenes on the soundtrack was Stan Wrightsman, who played with Harry James Band and other excellent people. And he played that interlude like concerto style, great pianist. The trumpet player who played for Jack Carson was Count Basie, later trumpet player. Snooky Young, who in that time was with Jimmy Lance, Lunsford, great trumpet, and the clarinet player who played behind Elia Kazan was Tony Rosata. He played with excellent musicians at that time, so the music is really exciting. And great records of blues in the night, one of them, the trio version by great unsung hero, Sonny Clark. So we are at the end of the show. One thing that I have to mention, this company that took me off mailing my emails. Many musicians do, I get them all the time. This company, oh, we don't support promotion of business emails. I said, I'm promoting music, you know. Anyway, so I don't know what I'm gonna do next week. I hope I can get it back, but I thought I'd tell you I have a great trio next Saturday at my son's Alexi's home. It's wonderful Japanese bassist Ken Okada and outstanding young Sacramento drummer Jim Miniweather. We're going to have fun time. And at the end of each show, I mention if you're able to donate something on a stream, you, on a screen, you have PayPal, whatever you can do. It's appreciated, and have a little sip. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.